Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment of Life Sciences for You. Trust that you guys are well and excited about our lesson today. In our lesson today, we're going to focus on a revision lesson on environmental studies. We've looked at several concepts over the last couple lessons on environmental studies. It's important that we review and summarize those concepts and then get into some revision-based questions. In our segment today, we will try and apply what we've understood and applied in the previous lessons to the context of understanding questions. That's a key component to being able to revise, is to take some questions from, from your textbooks, from some uh, assignments, and try and apply your understanding to that. And that's the best and most effective way to really test if you understand how the content is tested. So that's essentially what we're going to do today. Get through some of the main concepts, overview them, and then we're going to take some questions at different levels and try and apply our understanding to that. So hope you guys are excited and keen to join me on this. So let's get straight into an overview of the concepts and a summary of these. Well, as I mentioned, let's review the main concepts. Let's look at what ecosystems consist of. We've discussed the concept of what biomes are and the concept of ecology, where we've studied different factors and how they influence living organisms. We've spent some time looking at biomes and we paid special focus on the terrestrial biomes in South Africa. We also recognize that there are aquatic biomes, and these are important in understanding the context of a South African environment. We went on to looking at biotic and abiotic factors and how these influence ecosystems. It's important to recognize that we have to spend some time looking at energy flow through different ecological pyramids, as well as the concept of what trophic levels are. We also need to discuss and have discussed the different nutrient cycles with a special emphasis on the water, oxygen, carbon, and the nitrogen cycles. And in all of these, we've always mentioned the impact that humans have had on the ecosystems and our role that we play in maintaining this. So as we get into this lesson, as we revise this topic, it's important that we have a summary of these things. So the main concept that we spent some time ago looking at was the concept of biosphere. And if we were to unpack the biosphere, it was that part of the earth where organisms exist. And we said that can be broken up into the lithosphere, which is the soil and all the parts in there, the hydrosphere, which would be the aquatic water systems, so the rivers, lakes, ponds, streams, dams, as well as the atmosphere and the air that supports life. So those three components make up the biosphere. We also mentioned that biomes are an important part within biospheres, and we recognize that biomes were areas that are characterized by its unique climate, the type of plants and animals that are found in that area. So biomes are little areas that are characterized by its unique climate and fauna and flora, which is plant and animals that live in those areas. We also had an overview of the South African biomes, and we looked at these seven different biomes. And it's important that when we look at biomes, we recognize where these areas are, the type of climate that is experienced. We've looked at the typical or unique animals that are found in these areas, as well as the plants. And we've also discussed in the context of the South African terrestrial biomes, which of these are significant and important for us as one a mechanism of ecotourism, another in terms of conservation hotspots. So that's important for us to recognize. So we have also went on to looking at the concept of ecosystems, and we mentioned that these, again, refer to the interaction of the living and the non-living components with each other and their environment. We recognize that abiotic factors play a significant role in the environment, and when we talk of abiotic factors, we broke that up into the layout of the land, which we refer to as physiographic factors. We spoke about the soil. We also spoke about factors such as light, uh, pH of the soil. We've looked at um, the, the factors that affect the climate. We've looked at, again, I mentioned the word edaphic, and that included soil and its various components. We, we also need to recognize that we talk about energy moving from one organism to the next, and we discuss that through energy flow in an ecosystem. And we studied that by looking at food chains. And we said food chains illustrate how energy flowed from one organism, producers, to consumers, and to secondary and tertiary consumers. We then coined the term uh, 
trophic levels, which again refers to the position of organisms in relation to producers in the food chain. Um, we also spent some time looking at food pyramids. Again, the organization of either energy or biomass or numbers into these ecological pyramids. Again, a representation of the different organisms at different trophic levels. It's important that we recognize that nutrients are cycled in the environment. And in that, we refer to the carbon cycle, we refer to the oxygen cycle, we refer also to the water and the nitrogen cycle. And we see these four cycles as important because they are able to sustain the basic elements or nutrients that are required for living organisms. And by nutrients, we mentioned that these are the essential building blocks that organisms require in terms of their existence and survival. It's also important that at the end of this section, we recognize that the context of our environment is very important. One in terms of ecotourism in South Africa. What is ecotourism and its importance to sustaining our, our environment, as well as being able to produce jobs for indigenous and local inhabitants of an area. So that's an important part of understanding the context of environmental studies. We also included in that the human impact that we have. So in terms of the effects of human activities such as um, you know, pollution on the carbon cycle, on the nitrogen cycle, and how that affects the quality of the environment and the future of human existence on Earth. So guys, as we get into the rest of this, let's start by trying to apply our understanding. And I often do this by putting in some what we call, these are our feelers into the topic, and I use a list of terminology. And so often I advise my learners to be able to create a list of terms. And that is important when you study, because that allows you to be able to have context of all the important concepts in a specific topic. So let's try and use our list of terms, terms that you have created to help you answer these questions. So I'm going to go through these, and I hope that as we do this, that you are able to jot down some of your answers and then check that with me as I get into the session. So the first term we're going to look at is a set of interconnected food chains. So guys, remember that when we talk of food chains, again, a food chain shows the flow of energy from the producers all the way up to the different trophic levels. However, when we go into an ecosystem, we see that food chains are interconnected, meaning we've got food chains where at different levels interconnected. And that term that shows the interconnected food chains are called food webs. An organism that lives only in water. It's important that we recognize that we've got organisms that live on land and those that live in water. So the ones that live on land, we refer to those as the terrestrial organisms, However, the ones that live in water, we refer to those as your aquatic organisms. So it's important that we recognize that life forms exist on land, which are terrestrial, as well as in water, which are aquatic. The next term would be all living organisms in an ecosystem. Again, the concept of living refers to bi biology, so it's the biotic components that we refer to in an environment are the living components. The next term, a biome that is characterized by having large trees that are shade, with shade-loving shrubs in the undergrowth. So as you prepare on this section, it's important that you recognize the characteristics of each biome. And so some of these biomes have a distinct type of plant or climate. Here we're looking at shade-loving large trees which support undergrowth of plants that enjoy the cool. And this is, we often see this in your forest biomes where the shaded plants are covered below by the tall trees that are up. So this would be a forest biome where we see the plants that enjoy the shade right at the ba base of that forest. The next term, an organism that is not indigenous to an area but has become a problem. So this is referring to species that are naturally not found in an area. And so we know that we have plants and organisms that are naturally found in an area. We refer to them as your indigenous species. However, we do have species of plants and animals that have been brought in or accidentally or intentionally from other areas that are not naturally found in that area. 
And these organisms often affect the indigenous species. And we refer to these as your alien species. And these are plants and animals that affect the natural growth of indigenous species in an area. And finally, we're looking at abiotic factors that includes the height above sea level. So when we talk of abiotic factors, we, we refer to the factors that influence the, the living organisms. When we spoke about your physiographic factors, we recognized that there were three types of factors. So it was aspect, slope, and altitude. And so if we look at altitude, again, altitude refers to the level of the area in relation to the sea. So height above sea level will be altitude. So guys, we've gone through the segment looking at the application of some of our terms. We also looked at an overview of all the main concepts in this section. Trust that you've been able to relate to some of these terms. Let's have a short break, and when we get back, we'll take a few more questions on the segment. See you in a little while. Welcome back learners. We're going to continue with our revision lesson today. The context of our lesson is that we're revising environmental studies. We've looked at some terms and we've had an overview of all the important concepts. Let's try and apply our understanding now to the concepts of biomes in South Africa. So I've got a question on the various biomes. Let's see if you're able to assist me to be able to identify the biomes and questions based on this. So the question reads, Study the map below where South Africa's terrestrial biomes are indicated with numbers and answer the questions that follow. So here we've got a map of South Africa and indicated on this are the various biomes. And these are numbered with numbers, as you can see, numbers one to five. So we've got these various biomes that have been indicated. Also on these are an illustration of the unique species of plants as well as animals found in this. And it's important that we recognize that if you're able to recognize these biomes, that you're able to identify the unique species of animals and plants that inhabit these areas. Uh, it's often that a question is based on your understanding of identifying a biome, as well as being able to comment on the unique species of plants and animals found in there. My advice to you on learning the biomes would be to first be familiar with the geographical location of these biomes. So create a color mind, a color map, and color these out. Have a key in which you create a key to remember where the locations of the various biomes are. In addition to that, create a little table in which you identify per biome what the plant and animals that are found there, so unique plants, unique animals, and if you can note a few points on the temperature or the climate that is experienced. So that is helpful when trying to have an understanding of the seven different terrestrial biomes. So let's try and hope you can refer to those notes and assist me in answering these questions. So the first question, we've got to identify biomes numbered one to five on the map. As I mentioned, if we go back, we can see that these biomes have been illustrated and outlined on the map. Let's try and find biome number one. So biome number one, I'm going to circle that out for you, is in these areas here. I'll give you a little while to process that information. What's important is that you recognize the location of this area. So here we are in the southern tip of South Africa. Here you can find Cape Town, and you can find these areas here that are highlighted with that area one. And often it becomes very difficult for you to figure that out if you see it in this context in a black and white image. But here you can see the numbers scattered around, and that's number one there. Okay, so I'm going to park that for you for a little while and let's see if you can get that. The next area that we need to label is area number two. And here you're seeing a unique plant species that is found in this area here. Again, a very interesting example would be to be able to identify the plant species. And this is area number two. It does get confusing with the red pen, but I'm not going to highlight too much of that. As we move up, it's important that we find area number three and help me find area number three. And this is the one area that is right down there at the bottom. And if you think about it, it's probably the smallest biome in South Africa where it takes up the least area. And if you look at it, it's found around the George area. 
and it shows you a, a very small area that has currently the presence of that area. The next area is area number four, and if you look at it, it's probably situated, if you look at it, a larger part of the environment, and that's essentially making up a large area where we have these unique species of birds that are found. And finally, area number five, which we see all the way up here, which we identify with the big game that we see, which is unique to that habitat. So let's see if you got this right. So we've gone through the areas. I hope that looking at these indicators in the map where we've got plants and animals can assist you in being able to identify the different biomes. I've been able to write down these answers and so when I switch my slide, I'm hoping that you guys can check your answers in the next slide. So as I mentioned, this area here, number one, guys, points to the Cape Feinbos. Again, unique towards the Cape Town area. It's kind of towards the southern tip. Again, it's unique in that it's able, you're able to identify that by the species of plants that are found there. So here we're seeing the proteas. We also know that the Cape Feinbos is identified by the plants that are unique to this habitat, often referred to as an ecological hotspot. Again, an area that has unique plants that are found nowhere else in the world, but endemic to that area. So that's area number one. Area number two is called the succulent karoo. And so this is along the west coast of South Africa. And you can see that this area is an area that is obviously along the western coast, but it's prevalent along most of the western, towards the interior of that. And it has these unique plants that are called succulents that are adapted to the extremely dry conditions and arid conditions in that area. Finally, if we move to area number three, and as I pointed that out towards the George area, it's in this area, it's the small scatterings of this area, and this is the forest biome that we referred to. The next area, number four, was the grasslands, and these are the areas that are towards the central Gauteng, uh, Limpopo, coming down towards the uh, northern KwaZulu-Natal regions. So that would be your grassland. And finally, if we look at further up, into the northern parts of Gauteng in Blomfontein, up that way, those would be the savanna region. Again, unique in that you've got your big five game that is predominantly found in those areas. So I'm, I'm, I hope that you're able to carry out this exercise referring to your notes and be able to identify the unique species that are found. Again, I often use a map of South Africa to look at the provinces and link that to the biomes and it does help because it gives you context to the location if those are not shown on the map. Right, so the next question. Write down the number and the name of the biomes in which you will find the following plant species. As I mentioned, our biomes are characterized by the unique plants and animals that we found. The expectation from, from the teachers is often that you are able to identify a biome from the species that are given to you. So that's essentially what this question is designed to do. So the fuchis, the quiver tree are given to you, and these are uniquely found in a specific biome in South Africa. And I hope that you guys can recollect that, and we're going to try the next one, and we'll go and look at both together. The yellowwood and stinkwood trees are also found. So I'm going to very quickly move on to this. So if you're looking at your quiver and your fuchis, these are found in the succulent crew. And here you can see an image of a quiver tree there. And so your succulent crew is unique in that it has these species of plants found in there. The next would be your yellowwood and your stinkwood. These are trees that are found in, around your forest palms, and that would be in area three. Okay, we move on to the next bit and where we expect to do the same. But plants or areas in biomes that have proteas, ericas, and your ristios. So again, here on the map, clearly seeing an area which has the proteas. So that would be your, your faint boss, and that's in area one. Sweet and sour grasses, again, this would be in areas that have a predominance of types of grass that, that are unique in those areas. And if we look at that, again, that's in your grassland in area number four. So these are areas that have predominantly grass that is either the sweet or sour grass which are unique to the, habit, the habitat and attracts certain herbivores that prefer that. So it's important that you recollect that. 
And finally, plants such as the mopane, the monkey, thorn tree, as well as the baobabs, which are found predominantly in Area 5. And here's a beautiful image of a baobab tree that's found in that location. As we get through further into the question, let's see if we can get into the next bit. Which biome is the home to many game farms that attract tourists? Guys, we know that South Africa is unique for its biodiversity, but what is often a point of attraction from tourism is your big five. And so the big five are predominantly found in your savanna region. So we talk about our savannas being an area that has an abundance of your big five. The next question. Which biome is the main tourist attraction during spring where the whole area is covered with flowers? And so guys, I've got an image on the next slide which shows you a, a beautiful image of these plants that are predominantly flowering in spring. It forms a, an amazing uh, landscape to be able to see. These areas with many different flowers that are beautiful and come up in this specific time. And we have many people that actually visit our country specifically for this blossom of flowers that we see at one time of the year. And this would be your succulent crew. And here's an image of the, the big five that we would find in your savannas. So guys, essentially we gotta be able to understand that our biomes are unique and they're characterized by these plants and animals. And knowing that will often help us to be able to link that to an answer in a question. Finally, let's get to the last question in this. Which biome includes one of the world's richest floral kingdoms. So guys, we often refer to the Cape Feinbos being a unique hotspot in South Africa because of the types of plants that are found there that are unique. It's important that we're able to recognize this area as the Cape Feinbos. And if you look at it, it's a massive, beautiful arrangement of various endemic plant species that are found naturally in this area. Again, a rich hotspot of the floral kingdom around the world. Lots of endemic species exclusive to this area. It's amazing how beautiful these look when all the flowers blossom at the same time. Was I too short there, Jim? I can go on, but... Can I go? Okay, I saw two minutes and then I wasn't too sure if I was overstaying my role. Okay. You're supposed to sign that. I'm not supposed to hear that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's look at a few definitions as we wrap this segment up. The concept of endemic. Guys, it's important that we recognize, as I've just mentioned, the Cape Feinbos is home to endemic species of plants. And the concept of endemic refers to plants that are found exclusively in an area naturally and nowhere else in the world. So when we refer to endemic species, we refer to those species of plants that are found in one specific habitat, naturally and nowhere else in the world. The next concept are alien species. And as we know, the concept of alien refers to something that's from another part of the world or extraterrestrial. When we look at species that are alien, these are species of plants or animals that have, are brought in either by man or naturally into an area not by choice, but carried into that area. And they inhabit that area, affecting the natural plants that live in that area. So we talk about your alien plants being invasive, in the sense they now use more of the resources and they affect the plants that live naturally in that area. And that takes us to the next concept of indigenous species. And so the concept of indigenous again refers to species that are found naturally in an area. They may be found in different parts of the world, but they're naturally found in that area, and that's the concept of indigenous. As we wrap this up, we need to recognize that the concept of extinction or extinct species refer to a species of plants or animals that no longer exist, and that is important for us to recognize as a concept when we look at biodiversity. And finally, biodiversity refers to the variety, diversity is variety, of living organisms that are found, especially in the context of our South African environments. So, as I mentioned, it's important that we have an overview of the summary, the concept of an ecosystem, as we've discussed that, again refers to the biotic and the abiotic factors. We also mentioned the abiotic factors as the non-living components in an environment, and we recognize that these influence the environment 
and how other organisms live in that. And these, these included the, the factors such as your physiographic factors, your edaphic factors, which was soil, as well as the factors in terms of light, uh, temperature, rainfall, etc. So again, we need to recognize that these are factors that influence the environment and the living organisms. We also went into studying how energy flows in an ecosystem, and we illustrated that by using what we refer to as a food chain, which starts off with the producer and then illustrates how energy is passed down from primary producers, consumers, to your secondary, and then you find your tertiary consumers. It's important that we recognize that in a food chain, there are several levels of organization, which we refer to as your different trophic levels, and this essentially shows the flow of energy in a food chain. Food chains, as I mentioned, describe the relationships linking producers, consumers, as well as decomposers, and it shows you how energy flows. We also mentioned that energy can be illustrated in pyramids. We also have pyramids to show you the number of individuals at different levels in an ecosystem. So we refer to this, those as your number pyramids. And finally, we also can look at biomass as a measure of energy in, a per, in, a, in an ecological area. And that again can be represented using your ecological pyramids. Okay, so the next bit is let's revise these through a question where we often get options that are confusing. And so in this next question, you've got to be able to know your content really well. These terms are often confusing and requires that you analyze these descriptions and be able to link them to the correct term. So I'm going to read through the question so that you have an understanding of how to answer these. So state whether each of these phrases in column one applies to A only, B only, both A and B, or none in column two. And you've got to write down A only, B only, both A, B, or none next to the question numbers. So guys, in this question, or these types of questions, there are four possible options for each answer. So this requires that you read through the question carefully and weigh out each term and see if that is relevant to the description that is given in column one. Often, in haste, we get learners that make an incorrect choice. And in reflection, once they've written that assessment, go back and said, ah, had I known this, or had I read this properly, I would have got this correct. So spend some time, read these options well, and make the correct choice, knowing that you've read it carefully. So let's try and apply that concept now. So as I mentioned, these columns, have a term or a description, and we've got two possible terms, of which there are four possibilities. Either A, that is correct, B, both A and B, or neither of them, and we use the word none. So I'm gonna engage with you on each of these, and hopefully you're able to respond accordingly. So the first term is animals that eat plants. Guys, we do recognize that plants, that, con that animals that consume plants are your herbivores or your primary consumers. So let's remember that these terms, primary consumers, again refer to those that are the first level of consumers. So again, your herbivores are your first level of consumers. Herbivores, as I mentioned, these are organisms that feed on plant material. So in the context of eating plants, it could be both A and B that are correct for this answer or for this statement. The next concept of living Factors. So again, just two words. Let's see if these, uh, which are the most appropriate descriptions. So biotic, yes. Abiotic, again, guys, these are your non-living components. So in this question, the answer is A only. And notice that I am following the instructions. The instructions indicated that write down A only or B only. And it's important that I follow instructions and I write down exactly what the examiner needs me to write. The next concept is soil factors. So when we look at soil factors, again, soil factors refer to the factors that affect the soil. So this would include the pH, the humus content, water retention capacity, the air retention capacity. So again, the concept of altitude is not a soil factor. It is a factor that relates to physiographic or the layout of the land. Edaphic factors are, again, factors that affect the soil. So that would be B only. The next 
term is consumers. Again, consumers may vary in a different, in, in, at different levels in a food chain. You get your primary consumers, you get your secondary consumers. So let's look at these descriptions. Your autotrophs are the producers, so they are certainly not consumers. But your heterotrophs are those individuals that consume other autotrophs. So the answer there would be B only. Cool. Physiographic factors, and I often help myself by reminding me that the physiographic factors are the lay of the land. So in terms of this includes slope, altitude, and aspect. Let's see which of these are correct. So as I mentioned, slope is correct, altitude is correct. So it's both A and B are correct in this case. The next description is inactivity during winter. So guys, we know that some animals, to avoid the harsh environmental conditions or the extreme drop in temperatures, will go through a process of a winter sleep. And that process is called hibernation. We also know that there's a term called estivation, which is, again, a, a, a summer sleep, and that is to avoid the unfavorable or the extremely hot conditions. So here we've got two terms, hibernation and estivation. As I mentioned, hibernation is a term that describes the winter sleep, and estivation is a term that describes a summer sleep. And so the answer here is A only. Water bodies is the next term. And so water bodies in the context of the biosphere are referring to those components that make up the hydrosphere. So the context of this answer would be A, B only, whereas lithosphere refers to the soil. So the answer there was B only. And finally, the zone of life on Earth, again, the zone of life on Earth is the biosphere as well as the lithosphere. So both of these the biosphere includes the lithosphere, hydrosphere, and the atmosphere all support life. But it's important that we recognize that the lithosphere also supports life. And that, again, is A and B. So guys, that's a wrap for this part of the segment. We've looked at some basic terminology. We've looked at various ways of which these terms can be assessed. This is one way, and it requires a thorough understanding of the terms and being able to differentiate between these. So let's have a little break and I'll see you in a little while. Welcome back learners. Trust that you've excited about the rest of this lesson. We're looking at revision of environmental studies. In our segment now, we're going to focus on some of the abiotic factors and how they influence the environment and the living organisms. Let's get straight into this question. In an investigation, soil samples with different pH values were taken to determine in which pH range different soil animals prefer to live. And so that's essentially the context of this experiment, where soil samples were taken with different pHs and it was done to determine at which pH range the different soil sample animals would prefer to live. Study the following graph on the next slide, which shows the range of pH within which each of the four soil samples, soil animals were found. So again, on the next slide, we've got a graph that illustrates a pH range on the x-axis, and it shows you the species of soil animals A to D. And what's unique about this is that the graph reads the range of pH where four soil animals were found. So these are organisms, often your invertebrates, that live in soil. And so here we've got a range of different pHs of soils, and we've got a, an illustration of where, or the range at which each of these different organisms labeled A, B, C, tend to live or inhabit. So having understood this, we can see that there's an increasing pH scale, and these all again refer to the quality of soil, and these are your abiotic factors, which we refer to as your edaphic factors. So pH, again, influences the type of organisms as well as plants that live in an environment. Now, having looked at this graph, let's try and unpack some of the questions based on this. So the first question is, state the aim of this investigation. It's important that we have context to any experiment. And as again, as I mentioned, if we go back to the initial 
introduction to the question, it was clearly stated in that what the aim of that was. So here we can take that out from the question. In an investigation, a soil sample with different pH ranges were taken to determine, that's where the aim starts, to determine in which pH range different soil animals prefer to live. So that's the aim. It's to determine at which pH range different soil animals prefer to live. And that's essentially very neat and clean as to what the aim of this experiment is. Cool. The next question, identify the independent variable. Guys, I often get learners confused between the independent and the dependent variable. It often does help to refer to a graph. And we know that the independent variable is often plotted, is always plotted on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the dependent variable. In the context of this experiment, we know that the different pH levels are present on the x-axis. And hence, our independent variable in this experiment would be the pH levels or the different pH levels. Let's move on to question three. State to which abiotic factor pH belongs. Guys, we've been looking at abiotic factors, and in this context of this experiment, we need to recognize that pH, again, refers to the quality of soil. And if we were to group the various factors that influence soil, we refer to those as your edaphic factors. And again, we've mentioned the concept of edaphic factors. Cool. The next question, identify from the graph which species, A to D, let's see, occurs over the widest range of pH conditions. Explain your answer, three marks. Guys, it's important that we read the mark allocation for a question. This question has two parts to it. The first part requires us to identify from the graph, and the second part requires us to provide an explanation. For three marks, the first mark is identifying from the graph. The widest range of pH is certainly the longest on this graph would be D. So the species D will tend to occupy a range between four and almost nine. So that's about 8.8. .8. So if we compare that to the others, we can clearly see that the next behind that would be species A, which probably has a pH range of just above um, 3.2 or 3.3 to about 6.7, 6.8. So the answer to this question would be species D. That would get you one mark. And our explanation to that would be, when we look at species D, we can see that it basically can exist between approximately 4 to about 8.8. .8. And, we can comp and if we compare that to the other species, the others do not exist in this over such a broad pH range. The others are much smaller, and that can be determined by the length of that line. So that would be an explanation that would earn you two marks to that. The next species we've got to identify can survive in a pH concentrations below 4. So let's look at below 4. So all of these that can survive below 4 would be predominantly species C. Although we have a bit of species A in there, I think if I were to answer this question, I would look at P below four, it would be predominantly this part of species A. So the answer there would be uh, species C that is existing with probably species A inhabiting just a bit of that below A. So predominantly C, but if you did answer A, I would think that would depend on your teacher, and if you would accept that, you would be correct, but I would think, again, as I mentioned, C would be predominantly more favorable to attempt pHs below four. And finally, appears to be the least tolerant of acidic conditions. Now guys, when we look at the pH scale, we know that below seven, we would refer to that as an acidic environment. Above seven, we'd refer to that as being alkaline. So again, the question says, appears to be least tolerant of an acidic condition. So least tolerant of an acidic condition would be those that are living in an alkaline condition. So these species B here, you can clearly see, are living in a pH between, I think it's around 7.5 to about 8.7, 8.8. So in this case, the answer would be B, and we can justify from that graph as to which ones of them. 
Finally, list four other factors that influence the quality of soil. So guys, when we look at soil, we know that soil, the quality of that soil is affected by various factors. The one is we've just looked at pH, but there are factors such as water retention capacity. We also know that the humus content plays a significant role in the quality of the soil. So we mentioned uh, the water holding capacity, we mentioned the humus content, we mentioned the air holding capacity, and finally, pH, as we discussed, would be factors that all influence the quality of soil. Let's move on to a question based on an aquatic ecosystem. So this question shows you, this illustration shows you uh, an aquatic ecosystem. It shows you energy being used by different organisms and that energy flowing through in a food chain. We've got algae that are then consumed by the mosquito larvae, and in turn, the dragon larvae consume these mosquitoes. We see larger fish called perch, which are then feeding off these dragonfly larvae, and then we have a larger fish called pike, which are being consumed, uh, which are consuming the perch, and then these eventually form a source of nutrition or food for humans. So let's consider this as I've enlarged in that. We can see that this is a flow diagram showing you the transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next. Right, let's take some questions. What term can be used to describe the diagram illustrated above? So as I mentioned, a diagram where energy is passed down from one level to the next along a linear fashion, we can see that it's a one direction movement. We refer to that as a food chain. So this is an illustration showing you a food chain and essentially it's showing you how energy is transferred from one trophic level all the way to the next. Question two, identify the following. The autotrophic organism, again, the concept of autotrophs are individuals that are able to produce their own food. And when we look at this, we know that in an aquatic ecosystem, we have algae that is able to photosynthesize. In a terrestrial ecosystem, we have plants that are autotrophs. So algae are your autotrophic organisms and they are able to photosynthesize. Secondary consumers. Guys, we have primary consumers and we have secondary consumers. So if I were to label this, these would be your producers, this would be your primary consumer, and then these would be your secondary consumers. And then to get back to our question, the secondary consumer in this would be your dragonfly larvae. Finally, the herbivore organism. So when we refer to herbivores, we refer to those that feed off plant material or feed off your autotrophs. When we look at this, we know that your mosquitoes in this example are feeding off the a plant material, the algae, so we regard these as your herbivores. Yes, I know some of you might be thinking, well, mosquitoes feed off humans and they drink blood. Does that make them not carnivores? Guys, remember that when we refer to aquatic organisms, the mosquitoes that live in these water bodies feed off your algae, and so they live off plant material. It is only the female Anopheles mosquito that bites humans and uses them as a part of uh, their life cycle to complete the, the cycle of the parasite. But that's for another lesson. Okay, explain why the amount of available energy decreases at each trophic level. Guys, it's important that we recognize that energy flows from one trophic level to the next. What's in addition important to that is understanding that the amount of energy decreases. So the question is, why does that happen? Let's think about this. So energy is always moving from one trophic level to the next. Why do organisms need the energy? They need the energy for metabolism, for growth, for repair, for reproduction. So the organism at each trophic level is going to use that energy. So they're going to use that energy. So there's much less energy that they have acquired that they are able to pass down to the next because they've used energy for important processes. Some of the energy is lost during respiration, cellular respiration. Some of it is lost as waste products. And some of it is lost in food that is undigested 
or cannot be used. So we find that a lot of energy is lost at each trophic level because of waste products, heat in maintaining body temperature to the surrounding, as well as in the important physiological processes. The next question, identify two abiotic factors from the diagram. When we look at this diagram, we know that in an aquatic environment, like on a terrestrial, there are various abiotic factors. Guys, when we look at this, we know that sunlight is a factor that affects the li these living organisms. So if we talk about the availability of sunlight, these can influence the biotic factors. So the first factor is sunlight. And because we are in an aquatic environment, we do know that the pH of the water is another factor that can influence the survival. We also know that the amount of oxygen or gases in the environment is another abiotic factor. So it's the sunlight, it's the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water, as well as the pH of the water. And all of these are abiotic factors that can influence these organisms surviving. So guys, as we look at the last question before we wrap up, this is a question that shows you aloes that are growing on two different slopes. You've got north-facing slopes and you've got south-facing slopes. I'm going to wrap this question up as we end this segment. It's important that we recognize that these are plants that are facing the sun. And so these aloe plants are adapted to being able to absorb maximum amount of sunlight from these plants on the north-facing slope. I'm going to give it a shot at this one question before we wrap up. Are aloes hydrophytes, xerophytes, or mesophytes? Give one visible reason for your answer. Guys, we've seen aloe plants previously. You've probably been around in your garden or in, in different textbooks seen aloe plants. These are plants that generally are found in dry, arid conditions. And we refer to those as your zero fights. Plants that are adapted to living in dry, arid conditions. What are the adaptations that these plants have? They often have thick, fleshy leaves. They often have their leaves reduced in sizes or they have um, thorn-like structures on them. And these are all adaptations to reduce their surface area for evaporation. The thick fleshy leaves are able to store excess water and it often has a, a, a sour and bitter taste which often will be a retardant against some of your herbivores. And this is a mechanism that the plant has to be able to survive and ensure its existence on that. So these are adaptations again for them being able to live in dry arid conditions. So guys, that's a wrap for this segment. We've looked at the various abiotic factors in the segment. We've looked at how they influence life forms. Trust that you've enjoyed the lesson. I hope that you're able to reflect on these. Go back and attempt a few more questions on your understanding on environmental studies. You've been a fantastic audience. I wish you well. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye.